Hey everyone, Cal here, and uh, today I want to address the topic of investing in real estate when you've got very little of your own money or possibly no money at all. And I think a lot of people, when they're getting started out, they believe this idea that you have to be rich in order to invest in real estate, or you have to have a lot of savings in order to buy your first property or do your first deal. And really, that's not the case. Um, when I was getting started way back in 2009, I was a university student. I worked a part-time restaurant job, and so I had very little income. I did have a little bit of money um, that I had gotten from inheritance to get me going, so I did have some money to start with, but I had to learn how to do deals without really much of my own money at all, especially after I did my first deal, and then I had no cash <laughs> left. And to make it harder, I was a Canadian investing in the US, so a lot of the banks would not even look at me because I was not a US citizen. So I had two strikes against me, being a foreigner, and not having a lot of cash of my own, okay? And so I had to get creative and, and learn a lot of strategies um, that I could implement in order to do deals without any money, okay? And so I'd like to share some of these ideas that I've had and, and some of my own experiences with you in this video. Now, before I share my list of no money down strategies, I wanna say that it's kind of a, a marketing ploy, I would say. You're, you're gonna see a lot of marketing and gurus out there and that kind of thing saying, oh, I'm gonna teach you no money down strategies. Use none of your own money. And the thing is, is all of these strategies pretty much, you're gonna to have to have some money, okay? Sometimes it's no, no money in the purchase of the property or the acquisition of the property, but almost every strategy, you need some money either to market for deals, right? So to put out your feelers so you can find a good deal, you need some money usually for that. Or it might be to do your due diligence, right? Um, before you close on a good deal to make sure that there's no, uh, no issues with the deal, you sometimes have to deploy some money and hire professionals in order to uh, do your due diligence. So really, the idea of a completely nothing down, zero money out of pocket deal, it's kind of a myth, um, you know, except for very rare occurrences, okay? But what I'm gonna share with you now is my list of uh, very low money strategies where you can get going right away uh, with very little of your own capital, okay? So number one is house hacking. And I think the, the guys at Bigger Pockets um, on their podcast, they kind of started this, this term house hacking about a decade ago. But what it means is buying a property, typically like a duplex or a multifamily property, threeplex, fourplex, and living in one of the units and then using the rest of the units, renting them out and using that to fund your lifestyle, right? So taking the rent from the other unit or two or three and using that to pay your mortgage on the place that you're living in, right? And pay all your taxes and insurance and living costs. Okay, so they call that house hacking. And that makes a lot of sense, especially if you're young and getting going and you don't need a lot of space, and maybe you don't have a family yet, then it makes a heck of a lot of sense to buy a multifamily and then live in one of the units and rent the rest out, okay? And then as you grow your career and, and save your money from the income generated from that property, then you can go and do it again and buy successive units and then eventually you'll be able to buy your own house that you live in without having to share walls with other neighbors if you want, okay? So that's one way, house hacking. Now, a similar uh, strategy to house hacking is what I call the live-in fix and flip or the, the live-in remodel. And I first came across this when I was a kid. Um, we had a family friend, that they would do this all the time. Um, they would buy a house that was in need of renovations. They would actually move into the house, so they'd buy it cheaply. They would move into it and live in it for a year or two. And as they were living in the home, they would slowly renovate it and upgrade it until it was completely remodeled and then they'd sell it at top dollar and they make a bunch of profit on it all while still living in the home. So they only had the one expense. They had the mortgage that they were paying for their home that they were living in. They had a bit of an inconvenience of always being uh, living in a home that needed repairs, but that was their wealth building strategy. And they would, as soon as they'd make money on the one and sell it, they'd find another fixer upper, uh, move into that one and do it all over again. Rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. So they were moving every couple years but they were managing to accumulate a great deal of wealth while doing that. So if you're a handy kind of person um, and you have a lot of skills in renovations and that kind of thing, it might make a lot of sense as long as you have a spouse that's <laughs> willing to live in a property that's being worked on all the time, okay? So these next set of strategies I'm gonna talk about are under the umbrella of creative financing. So these are creative ways 
for a person to buy a property or finance a property when you don't have a lot of money. Um, so the first one is called a lease option or a rent to own. And this is very common for folks that um, don't have any down payments set up or saved up and they want to start buying a property and, and having something that they can consider their own. And so a rent to own is a way you can actually sell a property as an investor, uh, but you can also acquire a property as an investor if you don't have any down payment. And how it works is you negotiate with the seller to pay them a rent to own payment. And what that is, is typically entails a small amount of money up front, so a couple thousand. Um, it's called an option consideration. It's kind of like a, a deposit or a very small down payment. And then every month you're making a rent payment, but it's gonna be higher than what the market rent is for that property. And so the difference in, in what you're paying and what market rent would be, that goes towards your down payment. And so after a certain number of years, whether that's a year or three years or five years, the goal is, is by then you've been paying extra every month in, on top of your rent payment and that goes towards your final down payment. And at that point, then you can go and get the bank to finance your purchase of the property because you've over time paid enough to the seller uh, to have a down payment and then you can finance the property. Okay, so that's one. Um, I'm not really an expert, so my, my definition might have been a little bit weak, but I haven't really done any of those. Um, but the other way is you can actually do what's called a sandwich lease option, where you negotiate a rent to own with a property seller, okay? But instead of you now making the payments to own the property over time, you then do a rent to own or a lease option, same thing, uh, with a new family or a new uh, person that wants to actually own a home. Okay, but you just mark everything up. So let's say that I find a nice property, uh, I negotiate a rent to own with the seller and I'm paying them $1,000 a month. Let's say that rent is $750 and then $250 out of that thousand is gonna go towards the eventual down payment, okay? Um, well then I might go to my new buyer, my new rent to own buyer that I find and just up everything. So maybe their payments are gonna be $1,250 a month, okay? And so they're gonna be paying me $1,250, I'm gonna pay the thousand to the seller, and I'm sandwiched in between these two lease option contracts. Okay, that's why they call it a sandwich lease option. So I've created cash flow for myself, a stream of income, without actually owning the property, okay? I have my buyer paying me, and then I pay the seller, okay? And it's a rent to own. Eventually, the buyer that you have is going to be able to save up enough money for a down payment, uh, from the payments they're paying you and then they can finance the purchase of the property and meanwhile you've been meeting your obligations with the seller okay now another version of that which I am more skilled at and have done before um, involves both owner financing and what's called a subject to okay so a subject buying a house subject to is where you buy a home or a, any kind of real estate subject to the seller's financing staying in place on the property okay so what that means is let's say you find a house uh, looks like a good investment property and you negotiate with the owner um, that you're going to buy that house from them but their mortgage that they currently have is going to stay in place in their name okay so you might have to pay them some money as a deposit or a down payment and then the mortgage that they've been paying on stays in their name, but you now get the deed to the property and you start paying on their existing mortgage. So the deed to the property is now in your name. You get to take over the payments on their mortgage. So you don't have to qualify. You don't have to go to a bank. You just start making the payments on the seller's mortgage and boom, you've got a property. And depending on the seller's situation and the, the type of deal it is, you might be able to negotiate this without even having to put hardly any money down, like maybe a couple thousand dollars deposit down to the seller uh, so that they can afford to move out of the house. And you've now got the deed to a property worth significantly more um, because you're now taking on the, the financing for the seller, okay? So now you've got the seller's mortgage that you're responsible for, okay? And then from there, you can do whatever you want. You can remodel the home and then sell it for profit and then pay off the seller's mortgage. You could lease out the property and create a, a rental property situation. So you charge rent, the tenant pays you, and then you pay off the mortgage payment um, that's still in the seller's name. And then there should be a spread there that's your monthly profit, okay? Um, or you could do uh, kind of like the sandwich lease option situation, except for 
you now owner finance that same property to a new buyer. And this is what I've done before in Texas. So we took over the seller's mortgage, okay? We bought the property, paid about five grand down to the seller, took over their mortgage payment, and then we owner financed the property to a family um, that were looking to be homeowners, but they didn't have the credit, okay? They didn't have credit enough to go to a bank, okay? And so what we did is we created a owner financed mortgage note for the new buyer. They paid us a down payment that was greater than the amount we paid the seller. So there's some profit right from the beginning. And then they were making a mortgage payment to us. So a principal and interest payment every month higher that is higher than the mortgage payment that I was now paying to the seller's bank. <laughs> so it's, I can tell it's getting confusing, but essentially we're getting a, a loan payment from the, our new buyer. It's principal and interest loan payment. It's more than the amount that we're paying the seller's bank for their mortgage payment, okay? So the difference was about $500 a month, all right? So what we did is we created $500 a month cash flow. We collect the payment from the new buyer, we pay the seller's bank, and we've created a cash flow situation. Plus, we got a deposit from the new buyer or a down payment from the new buyer uh, that was significantly higher than what we paid the seller. Okay, so in total, we uh, only paid maybe 2,000 out of pocket plus research costs or due diligence costs and created a nice cash flowing uh, mortgage note out of the deal, okay? If that was confusing, I'm sorry, I'm gonna do future videos on that topic and hopefully I can clarify a bit. But anyways, moving on. Um, so other ways you can make money in real estate without having a lot of money. Well, you can always trade your time instead, okay? Time is valuable. And if you can get yourself well-trained and good at finding potential real estate deals, another way to make money in real estate is referring potential leads and deals to other real estate investors, okay? And we call this bird dogging. Just the way uh, you send your dog when you're going bird hunting, you send your dog out, it chases out the, the birds and then you shoot them, right? So this is the same way. You go and you chase out the birds, which are in this case, potential good property deals, you refer those those leads to your investor partner, your friend, whoever it is that's a real estate investor. And if they're able to close on the deal, then they would pay you a referral fee. And that might be 500 bucks, a thousand, 2000, whatever you can negotiate with them. And then, so what you're spending your time doing is driving around, we call it driving for dollars, driving around the neighborhoods in your community, looking for properties that need work, that show signs of distress. So it could be, you know, the lawn hasn't been mowed. Um, there's stacks of mail in the mailbox. It's overflowing. Um, weeds, broken windows, boarded up windows, graffiti. Just signs that either the property might be vacant or it's not being maintained and taken care of. Um, oh, warnings taped to the door, foreclosure warnings or city uh, violation code warnings. All of those things are potential uh, factors that would cause the owner of that property to maybe want to sell it at a steep discount, okay? And then you develop a relationship with your investor friend and you send them that address and say, look, if you buy that deal, I want a thousand bucks for it. Okay, so that's called bird dogging. Um, and then a couple other things, um, we, you could invest in REITs, uh, which are kind of like, it's a combination between real estate investing and stock market investing. So these are big companies that buy massive amounts of real estate uh, worldwide or, or nationwide. And instead of buying the whole property, you're actually essentially buying a share or almost like a stock in, in their properties. And you get paid a, a certain amount of return for your money. Um, and another way is crowdfunding, which I did a whole video on, actually a whole series of videos on a couple weeks ago. Um, so you can look that up. But basically, those are situations where you can invest money in other real estate investors or other companies that invest in real estate. And by investing small amounts of money, you get a set return um, on your money. So it's kind of a combination of stock investing and real estate. Okay, and then the last two are, are strategies that any investor can use, whether you've started out with a lot of money and you've got a lot of deals in your portfolio or you're brand new, but every investor eventually comes to the point where all of their money is already spent. It's already deployed uh, in other assets or other investments and now you've got the skills of knowing how to find good deals and negotiate good deals, but you got no money left. So what do you do? Well, that's when it comes down to using other people's money to fund and purchase investment properties. 
okay? And so there's two kind of ways you can structure that. But basically, the value you're bringing to the table is your know, all your know-how and skill, experience, um, systems that you've got in place, the teams you've gotten in place. You basically do all the work to find that good investment deal. And then you help someone else who's got the money earn a very nice return on investment, okay? And that's what I do a lot of. I work with private people that fund a lot of my deals, um, either as a private lender or as a joint venture partner, okay? So again, we find the deal, get it under contract, manage the whole thing. It's a turnkey, hands-off situation for our investor partners. They earn passive income, usually every month or at the end of the deal, if it's a short-term deal. Um, they invest their funds to purchase the property or purchase a part of the property, combine the funds and then they get a return on their money based on the success of the deal, okay? So the difference between a joint venture deal and a private loan deal is this. So let's say I have a deal, it's a, it's a fix and flip deal. I find a, a great property, I get it at a really great price, um, and I know that I can sell it and make a significant pro, uh, profit after I'm done, right? After I'm done repairing it. So I might go to my friend who maybe is a doctor or a dentist or something like that. They've got a lot of money or maybe a friend that's got a lot of money in their um, IRA retirement accounts, okay? And I say, look, I've got this awesome deal, but I just don't have the funds to, to close on it. Um, what if we joint ventured on it? And we both become owners of the property and we split the, the profits 50-50. So I do all the work, manage the deal, you put the money in and we share all the profits 50-50 or 60-40 or whatever it might be, okay? So that's a joint venture type of deal where the profits are split based on a specific percentage. The other way to structure it is as a private lender, okay? So you might have that same person and you say, look, I found this excellent deal. It's, a, it's gonna be a 12 month fix and flip deal. Um, once we sell the property after it's been remodeled, um, I'm gonna pay you out. But in the meantime, I'll pay you 8%, 10%, 12, 15% return on your money if I can use your funds to purchase the, the property and then fund the repairs, okay? And so in that case, they don't really benefit or, or share in the profits from the deal. Um, they're getting a set interest rate, a set return every month or maybe every quarter, whatever it is, on their money. So instead of splitting the profits a certain way, they're just getting a set interest rate. And it's set up just like a bank mortgage. So there'd be a promissory note and then a mortgage document that you'd record and they would be secured to the property. The property would be the collateral securing their investment. And then if you don't pay them, they can foreclose on that property to recover their investment, okay? So uh, that was a lot, Whew, I'm tired of talking. Uh, but those were my 12 or so ways that you can invest in real estate using other people's money or uh, investing in real estate without a lot of your own money, okay? And I actually forgot one, oh my gosh. One of the most obvious ones, wholesaling real estate. All right, I'm gonna do this one too. So wholesaling real estate is similar to bird dogging where you get really good at finding investment deals. But in this case, you're actually gonna find the deal, you're gonna negotiate a price with the seller. So you gotta get really good at marketing for deals and then negotiating. You're gonna negotiate a really great price with the seller to buy their home okay, or their property. And then instead of closing on the purchase of that property, you're gonna send all the details of that deal. Once you've gotten a purchase contract signed with the seller, you're gonna blast that out to your list of investors. You're gonna have a lot of investors on your list that buy properties in your city. And you're going to sell the deal or assign that deal to your investor at a higher price, okay? So real quick, let's say I get a nice property under contract for $100,000. Um, it's a stellar deal. It's either a great rental property or a good potential fix and flip deal. And then I'm going to assign that contract, that purchase contract. I've signed the, the purchase, uh, but I'm gonna assign my rights to purchase that property to another investor. But I'm gonna sell it to that investor for 110,000, okay? So they are gonna close on the purchase of that property. They are gonna pay 110,000. And 10 of that goes to me as the, as the assignment fee uh, because I found the deal. And then the other 100 is going to go to the seller as I had agreed with that seller, okay? So you can do a lot of deals by getting really good at finding deals and negotiating with property owners, getting the property under contract, and then assigning that contract to an investor that has the money, and you mark up the sale price, and you're gonna make short-term 
little chunks of money on every deal. Um, it's an awesome strategy, but again, you do have to have money to market and you have to have the skills to be able to find and negotiate deals. I think I'm now done. I hope you got some value out of that, maybe some tidbits and some strategies that you might be able to implement so you can start doing deals even if you don't have that much money. There's never any excuse to wait. There's never any excuse to not take action. There's plenty of ways to make real estate deals happen regardless of your situation. You just gotta put in the time to learn these strategies and then you gotta take action and get them done.